Globally, many vendors are talking about user behavior to help augment their cybersecurity defense. It's kind of trendy to be talking about that right now. But this can either mean, like I mentioned earlier, your users to help police uh, suspicious activities or using technology to detect changes in behavior of that users looking for either indicators of compromise or insider threat. So um, my first question is to Classy, actually. Um, you know, when I went to LA, uh, your CTO mentioned that you were the first to come up with the concept of human-centric behavior. So please describe to me how your organization used human factor to help with cybersecurity. Okay. So I think, first of all, we need to look at, um, you know, most cybersecurity organizations are still um, focused on securing the IT infrastructure. And reality is that, um, you know, uh, when you think of, of an attack uh, and when you become aware of that attack, they're already on the inside. And whether that's been done by a disgruntled uh, employee or an external attacker that, um, you know, have, uh, that are using uh, stolen credentials or compromised credentials um, to actually, you know, execute on, on that attack. Now, if you think about it, to the IT department, that is an authorized user. Right. So from a enforcement perspective, um, we uh, look at the threat by examining the two constants in every organization, which is, first of all, people and data. So the force point human centric cybersecurity approach is about looking at the human behavior and looking at the behavior of those humans and um, identi digital identities in a way to protect critical data inside an organization. Fantastic, awesome. Um, and David, from a CoFence perspective, uh, can you tell us more? Yeah, sure, um, and I think CoFence has focused on the human since the company was founded in 2011. Um, and specifically, we're helping organizations harness their users as a vital extra layer of defense against phishing attacks. Um, after all, it, you know, once that attack's evaded the perimeter and it's reached the inbox, the only way you're going to get reliable visibility of that attack to, to be able to do something about it is if a user is going to say that they've received it. Um, and when Mark Knowles in his presentation was talking about um, users who are good with phishing, he wasn't just meaning users that don't click, he was also meaning users that report. And we've got a community now of more than 21 million people wow. who have a simple, easy, one-click button that if they see something, they can say something. Um, and, and this stuff really works. Um, and throughout 2019, we know that of all the emails that users reported, a staggering one in seven were malicious. And think about that. Those are emails that technology has failed to detect but that humans have. And, and CoFence, correct me if I'm wrong, is going beyond just, uh, you know, has, has gone into the realms of incident response and remediation after detec detection, is that right? Correct. So the first thing that I uh, was focused on as, as a company was the concept of conditioning users to recognize a phishing attack. But uh, in more recent years, we've focused very much on the operational security side of the house. If phishing attacks are reaching the inbox, then what we want to be able to do is know that and rip them out as fast as possible. So we've got a combination of technology and humans that gets the detection from the users, an analysis platform that quickly figures out of all those reported emails which ones are the most malicious. And then once we know we're under attack, then I need to know everyone else who's received that email, not just the people who've reported it, so that I can then get those quarantined. Awesome. Um, so the one login story has a, a, a cool, unique Kiwi flavor. Um, when I first met one login in, um, uh, at Gartner in Sydney, they explained to me that actually the adaptive multi-factor authentication um, AI machine learning algorithm was actually written in Takapuna. <laughs> I was, immediately that gave me, uh, you know, a, a lot more thought, uh, you know, if I can support um, something that was developed in New Zealand, that, that's amazing. And so um, we have Richard Chatwin actually uh, in at this, um, um, at this conference, and he actually wrote that and, and sold it to one login, uh, which is why I think Kazar has an interesting, uh, uh, some interesting things to say about adaptive. Right. Uh, 
a multi-factor authentication. Yeah, just a quick shout out to the, the man he's referring to. It's the, the tall guy in the blue shirt in the back. <laughs> uh, so uh, there, there's plenty to say about cybersecurity. We're all going through a lot of different thoughts. Um, you guys are like the unsung heroes of cybersecurity, like protecting people from phishing attacks. One login takes a slightly different approach. Before you even get to your email, before you even get to those downstream applications, how do we make sure that that front door is locked properly? So one login, like the name suggests, is a single sign-on tool at its core. There's a variety of other use cases that go with it, but the genesis of it is that it provides single sign-on. I lock that front door, and much like the door that's in front of your house, there are two locks. Typically, there's a deadbolt and there's a door lock. You have to pass through that front door and then everything else is open behind it. The thing is that you have to make sure that that door is intelligent. So there are elements of AI and different types of ways to give you actionable insight. Uh, insight. Uh, but what Alex is referring to is the ability that when you're passing through that door, we will check your risk posture. Have you logged in from that state, that city, that country, that IP address, that computer, that browser? Is it an unusual time of day for you to be logging in? And depending on what your risk is at that point in time, we may challenge you for more factors, or we may deny you access to your applications altogether. Uh, and then all that technology basically enables these guys to also provide what they do. Awesome. And Cohen, um, last year in your keynote, you talked a lot about the human element and ensuring that there is a good understanding of external and internal um, concentric circle type. Do you, do you want to expand on that, maybe recap and, and go for gold? <laughs> <laughs> Think about some of the some of the key messages we've heard in terms of training, training, training. It's all of these pieces coming together, right? There's a there's a massive piece that tech plays and in, in the various stages, and there's lots of different stages. You've got to get your head around that. But if I think about the concentric circle that I had last year, it's um, it's augmentation by technology for the users, right? Because you've got to have both. Right? It's a hybrid model. The um, the technology deals with the volume. And the humans deal with a critical insight, right? And you can't have one without the other, you know, because they generate its own problems. The, the piece that I've moved on from that concentric circle this year is I'm looking at transparency of SecOps to make users part of the solution. So when you talk about your, your shield piece, yeah. right? So some of your cybersecurity is still considered a dark art, right? And when you, one of the last remaining dark arts in some cases, you know, particularly from a user point of view. So what I want to do is open up the SecOps data, data fields so that they're available not only to the SEC team but also to the users so they can see what's going on. There's transparency of the process. It's not our security team just collecting data on me. I don't quite know what they're doing, yeah. right? It's here's your actions. Here are the risks to some of the points you raised before about the phishing email piece. I love that. You know what I mean? Um, but really opening it up in a transparent way so users can make a call plus the training Right? to support the overall business objective, um, talking the health and before, the business objective of, uh, of what I'm trying to make with a SecOps program. Right? So I tend to take a very, I take a very holistic view, technology is one part of it, how do I empower the users to be the, the, the front thing. And since that change of strategy, have you seen your users step forward in terms of being more cooperative with your SecOps teams? Yeah, she would probably say now she doesn't get as much as much flack for when she pushes out any security policy, yeah. or, or you know KPMG some of its compliance programs are um, our next level, and uh, driving some of those out. She's, there's, there's much greater engagement scores now. So when we, when we run engagement scores for some of our security programs, we're articulating not just the security angle of it, but how it helps them, how it helps the firm, how it helps our goals, and their role, mm -hmm. their valuable role in that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Before I move on, does anybody else want to augment or say anything on that particular questions? Any questions from the audience, actually? Cool. So, um, in our opinion, in 2019, 
uh, I believe we saw an overuse of uh, the word AI and machine learning. It seems all of a sudden, overnight, every vendor had an AI machine learning concept, technology, and they just turned it on. Um, truly, when I, uh, I take a lot of vendor calls asking me to distribute their products, and a lot of the time, the first thing they go is AI machine learning, and I'm like, well, tell me a little bit more about it. And actually, you know, one, at one stage, someone was trying to pitch contextual, uh, um, um, contextual analysis as machine learning. That's something that was used as a spam filter in 2005, right? Now, um, describe your thoughts on how actually AI is, and, and machine learning is not the only, it isn't the solution to everything, but it needs augmentation from the human element. You, do you know what I mean? You, we talked about automation. I, I really wanted to jump into that other panel, but I, I, you know, we talked about automation in that panel, and there was a gentleman that said, well, you can't automate everything. Well, actually, automation only works when you have a human person checking some of those automations before it's actually, you know, are you really gonna block that user or remove that? executive from Active Directory because he's showing some weird indications of compromise. No, you want a human person to check whether actually he's traveling and he's VPNing back to Australia or something like that. So I'd like to open this question up to David to start off with, if okay. that's okay. Yeah, yeah I think um, technology has a, a significant place in all of this, and I agree with Karen, it's about, that's dealing with the, the volume of, 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 of the bulk of the work, but the, the critical decisions, it needs to be left with, with a human. I think, um, again, to go back to fishing, but it's a, it's a very human problem. It's originating from humans, it's targeting humans. Um, and for all of the good that um, new technologies can bring, the one thing that machine learning or AI will continue to struggle with is context. Uh, and you know, humans uh, are born with an intuition, a gut feel. Uh, mm. We should trust it. Mm. Um, for anyone interested in reading this story, um, read the story about a, a Kuros statue acquired by the Getty Museum in 1985. Uh, the curator there was desperate to get his hands on one. There were only about 10 known to the world. Um, but because the asking price was $10 million, he asked for <laughs> a long-term loan before he committed the money. And he threw every bit of technological evaluation of that statue that was, that was available at the time. And when eventually satisfied, he bought it. But an arts expert visited uh, just a few weeks later, and he said, you haven't actually bought this yet, have you? Because his instant repulsion that he had towards it was that it was a fake. And when they looked back at the paperwork, and they looked in more detail, there were zip codes referred to in 1955 that didn't exist until 1963. <laughs> there were bank accounts on letters relating to the repair of the statue yep. from 65 that um, wasn't an account that was opened un until 73. So if you're ever in Los Angeles and you go to that Getty Museum, you'll, you'll see it, and it's got a sign saying <laughs> fake or not. Um, thank you, Dave. It's really good. Uh, classy... You know, Forcepoint's been using AI machine learning for a little while, but you have augmented with your user behavioral um, philosophy um, on many different fronts. Could you care to expand? Yeah, I mean, uh, there is definitely a push towards analytics uh, with data learning in uh, the cybersecurity space. Uh, but what it does is it, it's helping enterprises to understand the user behavior um, and also understanding the, the engagement with the data, you know, the, the data patterns. So if you think about it, um, you know, using uh, user analytics, you can establish a baseline for what would be deemed as a normal use for a user and the way they behave. And as soon as there's a deviation from that, it would flag the risk that this is potentially a risky, mm -hmm. a risky user. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, cyber criminals, um, their aim is to, to target corporate data, right? And it will be a lot harder for them to do that undetected if an organization were able to baseline the user behavior and the interactions with the data. So you bring into that the machine learning with the automation, you can actually a lot quicker prevent and detect um, you know, some of these threats that, that are out there. So I think it's, it's playing a big role and you combine 
you know, all the analytics um, with, the, with the user behavior and, and, and the data and what's happening with the data. And as soon as you see the changes in that behavior, it gives you the opportunity to immediately you know, make some changes to your security policies, policies based on that user's um, level and role. So, so. Calvin, anything to share? Yeah, that's a, that's a journey, right? Yeah. Because I think of some of the POC, and well, first of all, I think of, and no disrespect to the vendors, right? Yeah. But if I believed every one of them, uh, they would solve all my problems by next Friday. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, yeah, 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 Thursday, Thursday, sorry, Thursday. So, no disrespect, guys. I get you a quote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, look, so the, so the first thing I, I would, you know, it, it is an absolute tsunami of the number of um, applications and solutions and that, that use AI and powered by machine learning and whatnot out there. Uh, so my first commentary would be having a really quick uh, POC process where you can map some of these things out, right, and 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 and, and step through that really quickly. We've we've had to get to that, otherwise we'd spend years just evaluating stuff. So we've we've worked that through. So I just want to comment on that because there was a comment before, right, around you know tripoc, right. So we've done quite a bit of that. Uh, the other interesting thing we found as we were onboarding these tools, and we spoke about fatigue before, you know, so it generated an enormous amount of, uh, let's call it insight, you know. We had to work through a program of filtering that down and refining. We're still not there yet. Mm. So it's one thing to onboard all these tools and really bring them about. Man, you better have a plan for the next piece after that, which yep. is... Using it. Using it. <laughs> Right? In a meaningful way. In a and meaningful way. Budget, yeah. Budgeting to have the staff to use it, right? Yeah, right. Actionable intelligence is yeah. a piece of muihut. Right. Ready, ready what you want. Yeah. Right? Um, and, and that's a journey. So my, my, only, my only commentary on that would be um, be realistic about your timeframes and bringing these things on and what's actually required in the entire life cycle to get to actionable intel at the end. There's no instant magic cure, is there? There is no silver bullet. <laughs> you don't put something in and everything is fixed. It needs to have a plan, long-term plan at that. Yeah, look, just as a comment before, I mean, we, the, we, we are surfacing up our user analytics now, right? Because that's part of informing people, oh, hey, we've detected this behaviour, right? What do you think? They, we get a copy of it, they get a copy of it. Um, are we arming people with the knowledge to, you know, um, have a crack at the system? Well, um, yeah, maybe. Right, but we're sitting on the positive side. If we're talking about the positives of, of cyber security, we feel it's actually closer to bring them into the tent, mm. right? And have a have a joined up conversation, have a collaborative conversation around how it works. But it takes time. Mm. Yeah, time and budget. Is that? Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll add a little bit more to what you were saying. So, One Login is a Silicon Valley company. I actually uh, flew here from San Francisco. Uh, when you're in that environment your marketing teams behave similarly to other companies in that region. Uh, and there's certain types of marketing that gets put into place, like there's fear-based marketing, which a lot of cybersecurity companies use. Like if you go to their website, it's all black and it makes you feel scared about what's happening in the world. And sometimes that works. Uh, one login and many of our like industry leaders, they take the approach of using things like AI and ML. I actually just told you maybe five minutes ago about an AI-like technology. The thing is that um, in the field, like my team and I, we don't call it AI. We don't call it ML. We actually call it like risk profiling. Actually, you were saying automation. I like that term better because the AI is only as smart as you can make it to be. It's not really learning as much as you may think, right? We're kind of programming it to pick up patterns or pro programming it to like realize that certain things are happening. And then we give it like a set of actions to take. And we hope that it makes the right decision and it doesn't lock out the CEO or like deny them access to something that they need. Um, so a lot of it is marketing. And I, I think that that's where like, uh, you know, you end up seeing product teams start adopting that, that terminology and making it their own. But in the grand scheme of things, we try to put it in a more practical sense. We try to relate with the fact that if I say it's AI, you're, you're likely going to roll your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I know now because it's you know like the use of it. Yeah, uh, but it, it's just a combination of technologies and a way to automate decision making. And it's not to automate all the decisions, but at least seventy to eighty percent of them, which are probably easy decisions to make that human elements don't need to be in that room making them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else to add and questions to ask?
So, Cohen, this one's straight to you. Straight on the spot. You know, um, pretty experienced CIO. Uh, you've seen it time and time again for years and years now. The battle between CISOs and users when deploying security you touched on. And actually now you've said that your strategy has been to bring them into the fold. Tell us, expand a little bit more. I'm thinking, how do you do it? What's going on? So, okay, so um, keeping it real. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was down in Wellington yesterday with my CISO and she was punching up her new security internet, internet page, right? And she had all the compliance bits and pieces and it was lovely laid out and I went, you know, actually, can I just, can I give you some feedback, right? And, um, and my feedback can be, you know, direct. Direct, a little bit direct, direct. yeah, I've seen it. Before. Can I give you some feedback? <laughs> I said, look, if I'm wearing this from a, what is going to drive me as a user to this page? Why do I want to go here, right? How do I sit at my desk and go, okay, I know I've got to do some cybersecurity stuff and already I'm rolling my eyes, right? Um, because I'm, age, I'm educated and uninformed in the business. What is going to get me to this page? What is the value prop for me? So I turned around and said, uh, we had the conversation around transparency, what it means for them, how they can be involved, how they can be part of the solution, uh, what the process is and what the benefits are. And we did it from a user perspective. So the first part in my overall strategy, and I'm calling it, let's just call it transparency for want of a better word, mm. right, or engagement, is that the education piece first, from a, it's all people-based. I'm not talking about tech. You know, it's a, your point before, I'm not talking about technology, I'm not talking about the tech, I'm talking about how is this good for them, what is their role in it, how do they provide value, how do they come on board and come in the tent? Yeah. So our first piece is education for the business to kind of really establish that value prop. And how have you uh, done that in the past or how are you currently communicating because, you know, KPMG is a large organisation. Yeah, you get them all in lunchtime and you tell them you love oh, them? Oh, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, we, no, it's fair to say we have, we're running... Internally at the moment, a focused adoption. So, funnily enough, with, with IT, adoption is one of your number one problems, right? User uh, adoption. User adoption. It's a, it's a, if you know, if you never stop to realise the benefits of the technology, you never realise the benefits. And people just default back to what's best for them to the point that um, was made earlier around changing user behaviour. So, outside of the education programme, there's a focused adoption uh, piece going on, and that is made up of some mixed mode learning. Uh, delivery styles, there's some hypercare, right? There's some um, immersion um, sets going on with how these tools come together to surf up, surface up the insights that, or the security insights that they're, they're generating at a user level, how that ties to the business goals and, and, and what we do about it. So it's a total project mm. to kind of bring it all together. Yeah. Um, to be fair, that, is a, that, that journey I've just described, that's a work in progress. Right, that's going to take some time to bring, to bring through. Is there ever an end to it? Eh, probably not. Right, in terms of you know the changing pace and and what's going on in the world and um, the different styles of attacks, but I think it's more important that we start now because you have to start. To Simon's point before, you've got to put a stake in the ground, and I've personally found that really hard. Uh, with all the choices out there, we you know you've got to put a stake in the ground and get going. So we. We're working through that now, and this program is to kind of bring that all together. But it's very people-based, very people process before you get to the tech. Awesome. Um, and because uh, from a user provisioning perspective, obviously you've got to make sure that it's <coughs> easy for the users to accept the fact security is going to give them one extra step to get them what they want. Do you want to yeah. explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. So there was like a, like a quote that I actually mm. recently read, and it was... If you've got, um, if you swing the pendulum too hard and you like start enforcing really hardcore security on your users, they're just going to reject it. And users are very, very smart. They'll just find ways around it. Uh, it's better to have like some sort of medium or level of security that 90% of your users will adopt. And we talk a lot about, again, not to make it about one login, but we try to talk a lot about how do we find ways to secure users in a silent and discreet manner. AI is actually a good example of that because it's like in the background, like doing its thing, like making sure things are happening as they should be happening. But uh, we talk a lot about ways where if, let's say, you were to leave an organization, what's the number one thing that typically gets left behind? 
like the lingering access to apps. It could be something like content management, like a box or a Dropbox or a SharePoint. It could be email. There's two aspects of that. One is that there's lingering access to some app that you shouldn't have because you left the organization. But also, you're actually paying for that license cost as well. So that's like costing you money to have that lingering access on top of this, the threat vector that comes with it. So like Alex was saying, we talk a, lot, you talk a lot about not only providing access to applications, but also how do we make sure that if you leave, it's revoked and it's, you're offboarded. And on top of that, like how do we make sure that we have an audit trail to show that when that happened, did it happen on time? Um, there's multiple aspects of user provisioning. That's kind of like the easiest thing to tackle first. We talk a lot about things like security is great. You're going to grow into it or you know, put a stake in the ground. What's the phase one? What are you starting with? And there are some easy ways to start introducing security that's silent and discreet and in the background. And it likely won't piss off your users. It's going to be <laughs> something that's going to be a bit more easy to, to, to stomach. And, and Classy, uh, Forcepoint has an interesting play around privacy um, and users and data. Uh, do you want to explain a little bit more about that? Um, look, first of all, I just want to add to this. I think it's, it's, it's very important to get that balance right. And you know, the approach we take is about stopping the bad and freeing the good. Um, you know, in every organization, most people mean well. They, they, they're doing the right thing. They're trying to do the right thing. And um, when they are trying to do something legit and they're getting stopped, you know, that's yep. when you end up with frustrated users. Yep. Yep. They, uh, you, you lose productivity. They're going to try and bypass the, the company policies, and you know it, it's not the right outcome. And it brings me back to the behavior piece. You know, if if you put that emphasis and looking at monitoring that behavior, using the behavior piece with the analytics, and and you can monitor that. And when you see that change, you know, you can make the the adapt that on the fly. I think that's very powerful because it's not stopping the, the right people from from doing the right thing. It's actually going to stop somebody that's trying to do the wrong thing that they're not normally doing. Um, with the data that they, in a way that they normally, you know, engage with that data. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, back to your point, you know, uh, I just wanted to get that across. So, yep, all um, good, we got time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, privacy is, is very important and you always have to, to deal with that um, in, in the right way. So for us, it's, it's a key thing to make sure that that is, you know, that is kept intact and that is supported and protected, you know, along the journey. It doesn't matter what you deploy and how do you deploy it, you need to make sure that, that those standards are there and that that's achieved. Oh. Can I grab it? I just, you know, so we, I spent, since the keynote from last year, we spent yep. years, we spent the year doing the silent, you know, under the radar yeah. type scenario, right? And you're right, users are smart. So the very next question that came back to us uh, once we'd started doing that was, what are you doing with my data? Yeah. Internally, you know, staff recognise that SecOps team is collecting. We have just as much responsibility to be transparent about it. Mm. Right, make sure we keep it and, and surface it up, which is why now we're including them as part of the as part of the process. Right, so I, I you're right. Um, just your your last point around privacy, but that's the reason that it's it's kicked off our transparency piece. Yeah, that's really insightful. That's interesting. Well, mate, I, I, Real interesting, actually. You know, well, you know, my eight year old my eight year old's better on my iPad now and the digital apps than I am. You know, they are just digitally native right mm. from the get go. Mm. They understand concepts of data movement, data flow, mm. way sooner than we ever did. So you've got to make sure that when you drop these solutions in, mm. that you have that transparency of process and you can explain yourself because half the battle with the users is, oh, that's part of it. Again, bringing them back inside the tent so they know what's going on. Yeah, It's not some black box. Yeah. And I mean, some of this is um, protecting the the good people that are trying to do the wrong thing by accidentally doing the, but are trying to do the right thing by accidentally doing the wrong thing. So sharing that transparency with them, this is not to, to prevent you or to stop you, but it's actually to help you as yeah, well. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I myself ex experience situations where if encryption, if something's stopping me from actually doing my day to day work, you know, I'm almost instantly thinking, please remove that stuff because it's just not working for me. And so I've had many conversations with um, uh, CISOs or security people trying to um, calm down the, the neurosurgeon um, because he's not able to get what he, you know, and it's time critical for him, you know, um, or, or the lawyers, for example. They're, you know, they, they have a tendency, especially if they're business owners, to call up the security team and get all security removed, and they have the power to do so in a business environment, let's face it. 
Um, and David, do you, do you have, uh, you're pretty much last. Uh, you, you got the floor last and we're, we're red. So um, <laughs> well, please share. Yeah, I, I, I speak to a lot of CISOs who are, are struggling to get engagement around broader security and awareness programs. And um, I think at the heart of this, we've got to remember that the user isn't an extension of the endpoint. It's a human being. Um, and I agree with uh, Klaas's point that um, humans in, in, intrinsically want to be helpful. They want to feel empowered and trusted. They don't want to feel tested and mistrusted. Yep. Um, and I think I'll, I see a lot of mistakes made by organizations who go down a punitive route. Yep. If, if users feel tested, like they're going to be tricked or caught out, if they're not told in advance of a phishing simulation, for example, that's going to be run, they're going to feel like they're being tested again. Um, what it's about is, is, is saying, look, you know what? This is a problem that IT alone can't fix. And actually, we need you. We need mm. you. So I'm going to tell you in advance, we're going to commence a phishing simulation program. Mm -hmm. It's not to catch you out. Mm. I don't, you know, I, I'm not interested in measuring how many of these things you click. I'm interested in measuring how many of these you can detect for me and report. Yep. And I'm not even asking you to make decisions about this stuff. I just want you to go with your gut feeling. If you think it's suspicious, hit a button, and then the, the, the security operations team can get to it and make the decisions about whether action needs to be taken. Yep. And the other thing is, you know, reward isn't just about you know, a, a chocolate fish or uh, giving people a, a card. It can just be simply the, the power of thank you. Yep. Um, nothing worse uh, as, a, as a user to report something they think suspicious and then hear nothing back. Mm. It's like, was anyone even listening to what I said? Yep. Was it looked at? Yep. Was, let alone, was I right or wrong? And that feedback loop, not only keeps reporting engagement high, yep. but all of a sudden, they're getting the real feeling. If they get a message back that says, thank you very much, you helped protect the organization from a ransomware or a malware attack today, they're gonna to feel good about themselves. And I've had the feedback from many CISOs that actually having that kind of reward-based, you know, trust-based program gets them buy-in to broader security and awareness issues. So interesting. Carl? 2016, KPMG had a ransomware attack uh, through the a through the accounts payable department. Right, clicked on the link at that stage. We weren't, you know, we didn't we weren't as prepared internally uh, for for this particular link with all some of our global things. She's still working there. She's still in the same position, right? She, um, I can tell you now, she probably went grey overnight, mm. right? Yeah. You know, now it wasn't successful to the point around backup. We had awesome backup, so we just simply dropped the server stack and carried on, right? Um, you know, did it, did it uh, raise a flag to the executive? Did that suddenly my SecOps budget jump? Yeah, right? Yeah. But, the, you know, uh, handy, handy. <laughs> not, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I oh, look, let's not talk about self-engineering. Right, let's not. <laughs> so I can send you a quote, right? Yeah, right, right, let's not. Look, I said, all right, let's not do it anyway. I, I, didn't, I didn't like the fire. <laughs> And if I, if I could add to that, um, sure. in, in terms so of, um, <laughs> I, I, I met a, the CIO of a, of a software company who, I was on a Monday and the previous Friday, they'd been hit by a multi-redirect credential harvesting attack. And um, they had a culture where no matter what happens, raise your hand, no one's ever going to be in trouble. We want yeah. to know about it. Totally. Right? And this was, totally. the reason why this was so vital is that one salesperson in that software, software company gave their credentials away and within seconds, their email account was being used to fish all of their supply chain and their customer base. The fact that a few seconds later, he thought, maybe I, maybe I did something there that wasn't quite legit, mm. and made a phone call mm. that meant they could divide, di divert all of their inside sales team to basically call all the supply chain and customers that they could see that email wow. account had fished before Amazing. they could shut it down. Yeah. That kept that that kept that problem out of the papers. Yep. That saved their brand reputation. What a user case. Ladies and gentlemen, please round of applause.